Good afternoon, everyone. Let's move on to the second part of lecture five related to plane stress and plane strain. Today, we will int uh, introduce you with another type of elements we call it as a quadrilateral elements Q4. As we said, uh, have seen previously, these chapters will intend to cater for the cost outcome number one, two, and three. So a bit recap on what we have uh, learned previously. Last uh, week, we mentioned that uh, we intend to solve for a two-dimensional problem, right? We use a planar type of element, such as the CST, the constant strain triangular elements, as well as the Q for so-called rectangular type of elements. Mm. It's related to the rectangular plan elements, okay? Or we, we call it as Q4, okay? Quadrilateral with four corner nodes, okay? So in this element itself, as we can see, uh, there is only four nodes. Therefore, uh, there is no mid point or mid nodes in between the the edges right so the advantages of using this q4 over the triangular elements is the ease of data input okay you can easily in, enter the coordinate and so on then is simpler interpretation interpretations of uh output stress okay is easier to calculate okay uh, but then there's at disadvantages of the q4 which uh they poorly approximate the real boundary condition ages okay especially when there is a, a corner okay so if we use a rectangular type of elements you may have difficulty to to actually approximate the curve uh, part right so the steps to derive for this q4 are very similar okay we will just go through uh, as quick as possible. So first part, uh, the step one, you will have to select the element type. Okay, so here we tend to uh, try to see what is uh, how to derive for the Q4. Okay, so the Q4 actually basically is just a rectangular element with four nodes. Okay, so you have seen the, the nodes one, two, three, four being labeled in the clockwise uh, directions. Okay. So the base and the height will be 2B as given, and there is a unknown uh, model uh, displacement, okay? So this unknown model displacement, as we can see, there is U1 and uh, V1. U1 and V1 represent the displacement along the X directions and the Y direction for each, the for node 1, okay? So you have node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. So every single node, there is 2 uh, degree of freedom. So there, there will be 8 unknowns for the nodal displacement, right? Okay, so then we will start to select the displacement functions. Okay, since we have 8 uh, degree of freedoms or unknowns, then we will have to create uh, the so-called uh, so displacement functions, okay, with uh, 8 constant okay so we have a1 until a8 all right so for u we have uh the u linear displacement function we have a1 plus a2 x plus a3 y plus a4 x y okay similar for the v right so how we can do this okay you just uh go through the previous uh lecture okay we have tried to formulate the shape functions by using this okay so what we can do we will uh form them into a matrix okay so we just form into a1 a2 a3 a4 until a8 okay to form into matrix in order for us to eliminate the 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 constant a all right so here you can form into the matrix one x y x y okay to multiply by by the a1, A2, A3, A4, in order for us to get the U uh, linear displacement functions, okay? Similar to for the V displacement function, we, we have this matrix, okay? So if we want to really solve them, okay? To solve for this A1 until A8, we have to, we need eight uh, 
uh, uh, simultaneous equations. So what we do, we just write them or expand them actually into the knot, right? So since we have four nodes, so you have one, two, three, four, okay? So, and then we just rewrite the equations for each of the node, okay? And this corresponding to this, right? So therefore, from this, uh, this function itself, then this u, x1, y1 represent u1, okay? This uh, u, x2, y2 represent u2, okay? So what we can do is that uh, you can form the symmetric equation. So you have u1 equals to a1 plus a2x plus a3y plus a4x1, y1, okay? So that is how we can uh, we can form the equations and we can run through the eight equations. Okay, so this matrix is just to help you to to run in the program. Okay, so that they can uh, do the calculations and solve it on their own. Right. So by doing that, uh, we have eight equations. Solve them simultaneously. Then you can solve for the a one until a eight. Okay. At the same time, you can we can try to eliminate to form this u and v equations. Okay, so you, eventually when we remove all this, we will obtain this uh, linear displacement for uh, u and also for v. All right, so as given as uh, in the equation six point six point three. Okay, so now uh, from that. Uh, equation itself, if we try to locate this kind of form, okay, we will see that the shape functions appear, okay, the n appear, okay, from the previous equations. So this shape function itself, we can write as n1, n2, n3, and n4, okay, which represent the shape function for at the not 1, not 2, not 3, and not 4 itself, okay, as given, right? So graphically, okay, for us to to visualize okay then the shape functions at uh not number one okay not number one then you would we can see that uh the weightage or the values at not number one will be what equals to one okay for both x directions as well as y directions okay so if we want to uh directly okay check whether the shape functions being derived is correct or not we can have a quick check actually okay we can uh form the linear uh functions for this part right so this represent how the weightage actually change okay shifting from uh not a not one to not two right so if we form the linear equations okay this is just uh y equals to mx plus c so you have y equals to mx plus c you can we can get the n1 will be equals to minus x plus b divided by 2b okay to represent this particular part similar for the y uh l1 y itself they have a similar uh, equation so if we combine them together to to obtain the shape functions okay for node number one we just multiply them for the x and y combinations we will have these equations okay and we, if you compare this with uh our previously derived shape functions they are equals right so this is the the ideas behind the shape functions right so all these shape functions will have the similar requirements right so once we have the shape functions and now we can uh, rewrite them in a matrix form, okay? In this course, okay, many times we rewrite them in a matrix form so that they can systematically compute, okay? Just like what you have learned in the numerical methods, okay? They can compute traditionally uh, calculate, okay? You can do this using MATLAB, Scilab, or even Excel, okay? So if you don't have those tools, you can always depend on Excel to to run on your code, right? Or to run on your calculations, okay? Excel have a, a built-in functions to solve for metrics, right? So you just Google from there, you, you can solve them, right? But then there is some limitations on the on the number of 
or the size of the matrix okay so you have to be aware of that all right so once we have obtained that uh now we move to the stray strain displacement and the stress strain relationships okay from for this part uh is very similar okay we already have our defined uh, relationship for the strain in x strain in y given as such okay as well as the the twisting okay part of the strain okay so we given by this all right so uh here we can uh what we do we just do the partial uh differentiations okay respect to our equations previously okay so since we already know the a1 a2 a3 and a4 assuming that you already performed the symmetric equations previously okay you already know that so we can actually uh calculate okay accordingly right so we, if we take derivations with respect to x so we will obtain this equation with respect to y we will obtain this equation and so on okay and then all this strain okay there are the relations we they are related to the nodal displacement okay so again we try to re rewrite in this form okay and we identify or separate them away with the displacement uh the unknown uh parameters okay so we we notice that there is this part b b matrix okay so this b matrix is given as such right so you can try that on your own right similar to the stress so once we know the the strain then we can always calculate for the stress okay where this stress is just a multiplication of uh functions or matrix okay depending on your problem if it is a plan stress problem then we use equation 6.1.8 okay then if it is a plan strain problem then we use 6.1.10 right as uh as seen okay so uh what we do when we multiply them together we will obtain this uh the stress uh matrix okay so all these are computationally uh uh intense all right so you need you can try it on your hand all right but then later on uh computer will will do better okay then uh after we obtain that uh we will start to derive the elements uh, stiffness matrix and equations okay so this part uh we will depends on this uh, stiffness matrix defined by the integral okay a double integral all right given in uh previous lecture okay so here we rewrite as 6.6.10 .6 okay you can always see back the previous equations number right so double integrations uh when we integrate them we will obtain uh what we want okay the elements uh the k the stiffness metric itself all right so this double integrations again uh here is mathematically represented okay but then in the computer uh, or in the software itself they will run the numerical integrations okay they will do the nu numerical uh integrations that's why it comes in uh with the methods like uh newton Cattles, okay cortis uh or maybe gauss uh gauss methods all right so all this uh uh common methods that used in the software itself all right so different methods will have their advantages disadvantages all right but then most of the software now they tend to move or uh, use the gauss uh quadrilaterals uh methods okay to solve for the integrations right so that part the miracle part uh on how to solve them uh is not part of this subject okay it's just uh, a knowledge okay on how if you are interested you can always uh check that okay on your own right so once we have uh, obtained this uh, element stiffness matrix okay the rest will be uh, similar to what we we need to do all right you can form the we can form the element force matrix okay as well as this is the the unknown okay displacement okay so these unknowns we have already obtained previously right okay remember we have come up with the equations previously and we should able to solve for that okay once we have solved for that then we can calculate what are the forces and how they are in track okay they may be in track back okay that's why there's a 
the so-called uh, looping or there is a interdependence okay that's whenever a calculations occurs they will do calculate and then check okay so this part may become part of the checking part okay to ensure that they are matching okay once they are matched means they have converged right so every calculations every single elements they will run okay again but again uh, on their own okay to ensure that at the end all the the metrics or the equations are actually matched with uh, the force given right they have uh, to to check that that's why there is this convergence uh, part coming in right compare the cst and the q4 elements used for modeling the displacement or the deflections of a free end cantilever right so you can see that this is a cantilever problem fixed on one end if another end is free and is subjected to a load right so the force is 4000 if the length is one meter the moment of inertia is given thickness is given as well as the young modulus right so using those theoretical uh, models that you have learned previously we can actually calculate and or estimate the displacement at the end of the cantilever beam right so what we have here is we compare we uh, using different type of plan element the q4 as well as the cst type and then also we varies the number of row okay so what it means is that this two it means we have two two particular rows okay so we may have only like this okay right so two rows okay two rows of elements just like this okay two rows of elements this one we have eight rows of elements okay? so we have two row four rows and eight rows same thing we repeat it but we use the cst type of plane element with two rows four rows and eight rows okay at the end we also compare it with the classical beam theory that we have learned in the strength of material okay so from the theor classical beam theory that we know okay we have estimated that the free end displacement should be 6.667 to the power of minus 4 meter right so this is roughly about 0 0.6 millimeter okay with a principal stress of 20 mega pascal right so now what we can see is that if we compare the results of the stress okay by increasing the number of rows so it's basically very close to what we have estimated through the classical beam theory whereas for the cst the principal stress is very low when we are using only two rows but it slowly increase or converge towards the 20 so if we in further increase maybe to 16 or or 20 rows then the principal stress will now reach to uh, 20 okay but before we, we look into the stress uh, we would want also to analyze the type of uh, displacement right so in real okay in real uh, type of evaluations for a final element model we would want to evaluate the displacements first okay before we evaluate the stress okay because the displacement give us the kind of uh, physical visualizations okay uh, what would occur whether it's it's true or not right so based on that then only we if this is true then only we will take the stress into considerations all right otherwise if the displacement is not correct then for sure the stress is also not correct right so this is exhibited uh, or shown by this all right so for the q4 elements even with a two row four rows or eight rows okay they they have the type of a uh, free end displacement which is very close to this right six 6.6 okay whereas this is 6.7 okay so very minute uh difference okay but then for a cst with two row is only three uh 0 0.3 millimeter okay of displacement okay so which is only half of the of the 
the actual displacement that we estimated through the beam theory okay so meaning to say this cst with two row is quite stiff okay quite stiff okay that's why when it is stiff it doesn't uh so called displace much okay but then uh, as we increase the number of element it become uh, closer or converge through the uh, class classical beam theory okay so from that we would see that the closer it is to the to the actual value okay or the beam theory value okay then the stress is also getting closer right closer right to to the to the the principal stress is also getting closer to what it is estimated okay so this is how effective it is when we use a q4 element okay to model the the displacement or the deflections of a, a free end okay so as an assignment to you okay so this would this would be the second assignment that you will have for this uh, course and probably the last assignment that you will have to submit for this course right so this uh this sessions okay you will have two two i would say questions okay that you would combine as an assignment okay so your assignment is to produce a powerpoint presentations okay Pro powerpoint presentations that uh, consists of the analysis okay doing so something similar okay but you have to do it the analysis on your own okay by using q4 element with two row and ten column okay meaning to say this is two row ten column one two three four five six seven eight okay one two three four five six seven eight nine ten okay sorry All right so ten column two two rows okay so that would be one okay then second one would be using cst but two row ten column type one okay so this this directions okay this is the the fixed part okay this direction would be type one the other side directions would be type two as well as this way okay you just repeat it right just repeat this this form okay that would be type 3 right so you will have one column two column three column four column until ten column right so we compare this type of uh, mesh and see what would be the uh, displacement as well as the principal stress right so you run the analysis using uh, maybe theoretical calculations or maybe you can use lisa fea software right so the questions will have these uh, parameters okay is okay the load would be two kilonewton right the length of the beam would be 100 mm height would be 20 mm thickness of this plan right is is uh 5 mm okay so based on these two you can calculate the the moment of inertia yourself right so it's a pure rectangular right so from there also we you are given with the typical young modulus of uh, a steel right so this is what parameter you will use for your analysis okay so you just compare with run the analysis using this four type of mesh okay and generate all the results put it uh visual visualize them into your powerpoint and then maybe you can do a, a table of this okay similar to this to compare and discuss right so after you you do the powerpoint then you just do a simple recordings okay using this powerpoint okay to present your uh findings Displacement result is we can see that the CST model produces the uh, mo uh, model itself, okay, and it converges uh, slowly, okay, to the classical beam, okay. This is partly because of the characteristics of uh, the CST itself, and when we deal with the bending problem, the stress actually uh, linearly 
dependent or varies with the depths. Okay, that's why whenever the the number of row along the depths increase, the results get, getting pet, better. Right. So the Q4 again is pro, uh, predict more accurate deflection behavior than the CST, and the number of rows increase to four and then eight. Okay, increasing more accurate. Okay. So uh, this is what happened, right? So we can see that uh, the two node uh, element itself, all right? The two node element itself, given in the theories, okay? When you are not concerned, okay? With the, with the stress concentration, then yes, you can uh, apply this so-called beam, beam elements, okay? You just use beam element right instead of using the cst or the q4 right so this beam elements will give you a good uh satisfied results okay if when you are not concerned with the stress concentrations okay so this is the general ideas of it right so if uh you know that uh, a single row q4 with their linear is not recommended okay single row itself okay it's not recommended for Q4 because of the behavior of the linearly uh, decreasing or changing stress, okay? There is a stress gradient through the depth of the beam, okay? That's why, if possible, two or more, right? This is where when we do or when we model uh, the, the, the final elements, okay? The directions of the force is important, okay? When... And it will helps you to decide the number of uh the meshing okay along that particular directions okay so this is a uh, critical uh informations for you okay when you're doing the 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 modeling all right so here there is a uh, one famous or maybe popular keywords okay shear locking okay shear locking is more or shear lock itself okay it's more commonly known all right or in other words they may call it parasitic uh, shears what happened is that uh as we can see what happened in the previous uh you can see that uh, the cst itself uh produce poor results because you can see when this is a two ele element row the the displacement is very small means the the beam itself is very stiff, right? Okay, why this happens? Okay, we call this phenomena as a shear locking. Okay, in this shear locking itself, the CST have a, a force shear stress occurs inside, okay? That try to absorb those energy, okay? So whenever there is, they absorb this so-called energy means the energy that's supposed to go for bending is now lost, right? So we call this phenomena as a shear locking, okay? Or other words paras parasitic shear okay so what we can do uh in problems where plant stress a uh, plant strain condition exists okay and the poison ratios approaching 0 0.5 the maximum value of the poison ratio 0 0.5 okay uh mesh can actually lock okay this is where it's where it's confirmed to lock, all right? Okay, so means the elements or the mesh will not able to deform anymore, all right? So a, a simple illustrations, this is a beam, okay? When we apply a bending uh, moment itself, in the actual case, we expect the bending, right? But what happened in the shear locking is that the displacement of the knot shift, but not bend down. Okay, that is what we call shear locking. Okay, and this will result to the error in the stress itself. Okay, because of no changes in terms of a uh, displacement throughout others not okay along this member. Okay, so as we can see, uh, the shear stress itself uh, is dependent on the displacements. Okay, so first thing whenever uh someone try to analyze the FEA results, okay? The experts, they will always look at the displacement result first, okay? Even though 
the intention is to check the stress okay because the displacement give us a visual okay or more uh, a visual kind of image a uh, visual type of uh, effect okay that we can imagine okay if some forces acting you can predict okay visually okay in my, your mind or your from your experience how it change okay that give us a very important information okay before we check whether the stress how how the stress is actually uh change okay corresponding to the displacement itself okay so first thing check the displacements first okay whether it's correctly represent the actual conditions or not okay otherwise whatever stress results that you get may not be correct or true to the real situations okay in order to mitigate all these problems yes we can always use a final mesh okay depending on the computational uh capability of your computer okay but we can uh, always refine our mesh okay to allow small bending to occur right so here is one uh tutorial questions you can try it on your own so this part will uh discuss more on the difficulty in the modeling itself and what you can do during the meshing right the typical way of doing it okay during the meshing okay so difficulty in modeling is the uh, phenomena or the or the process itself is understandable all right because uh it highly depends on the knowledge okay if you know more physics uh phenomena occurs okay then it will help you to model better okay on the real conditions okay then this difficulty in modeling will include like choosing the proper type of elements uh understanding the type of boundary conditions as i've mentioned uh the physical uh phenomena occurring or imposed on that particular process or the problem itself okay then also the kind of loads okay what is the numbers and how you can get all this where they are acting okay the locations the magnitudes all this in real we just apply it right so there is load but in actual how we get this number one one newton 10 newton 100 newton we don't know right so we have to have this basic uh mechanics or fundamentals to help us to actually uh estimate all this value and how they can be uh, located in the model itself okay that's uh free body diagrams will helps you to actually locate all these locations okay so when we apply the loads as we have discussed previously all the forces or the loads will be applied at the node not in between the node okay because the fea itself will not calculate the force acting in between the node all right except there is uh, a bit node in between the 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 edge of the element is right so most of the commercial code or commercial program they they, they will all usually call it as a commercial code okay because that program behind it is the code that code is the the intellectual property of the, that software right so those codes will give us warnings like uh overly distorted element shapes uh checking for whether there's too much support no support okay when we apply a force when we forget to give a support then the 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 object itself will fly right when you do the simulations and so on right so all this is up to the to the users okay that's why all this knowledge will will helps you okay the more you you learn okay and you practice then you know what kind of difficulties okay so you can always search online Okay, Google is your very good friend, is my very good friend as well, right? So you just search for the literature to overcome all this uh, difficulty, okay? So you can search and you will see that, uh, for example, in NCIS, there is a student com community, okay, that talk about the convergence issues high for the highly distorted elements and so on, okay? So that will help you, right? So first thing, uh, that's uh, the software or the commercial codes will do okay to help you is they can calculate the aspect ratio okay so this is a very uh, 
essentials uh, parameter that most of the FEA uh, analyst analyze okay we will we'll do okay they will check the aspect ratio okay this aspect ratio is actually the ratio of the longest dimensions to the shortest dimensions of a quali quadrilateral uh, elements okay for example we can see that for this uh, diagram itself the aspect ratio will be 24 okay very long and very short on the two edges all right then it slowly changed to 6 3.6 1.5 1.1 and so on okay so what we can see that this aspect ratio in many cases when it increases then the accuracy of the solutions the in, in can, the accuracy of the solutions will decrease okay or the inaccuracy of the solutions will increase okay so the higher it is the accuracy will decrease right so this is the uh the studies okay on how the percent error in the displacement itself okay actually change okay as the aspect ratio decrease okay so when the aspect ratio decrease then the accuracy actually increase right so it's getting nearer to the exact solutions okay so for a uh quality the a q4 itself we would like to have a low aspect ratio as well as the corner angle of the quadrilateral near 90 degree okay they can have something like this okay when they mesh okay but if possible as near as 90 degree as possible okay that uh if unless you are doing the the meshing algorithm then I think you cannot control much, okay? You can only control several things, okay? How it looks, you can do a remesh again, okay? To obtain a good element, okay? But how the software do the meshing is their own algorithm, okay? That's why there is the studies or research on the meshing algorithm as well, okay? On how to mesh a good one that meet all these conditions, right? so if you you want okay what we can do is if let's say you have an object in these shapes okay in order to get a proper meshing okay let's say you want proper meshing uh on this side which you have a slanted so what we can do you can do a partitions okay you can always do a partitions so that when we mesh okay it is always constrained okay with our so-called uh desired angle all right so this is how we can do it okay or else the software will will run on their own okay this is how we can manually tweak the meshing itself okay so there is a uh, exceptions for case where the aspect ratio approaching 50 still produce a uh, reasonable or satisfactory results okay this is when uh, that particular elements itself is not subjected to stress gradient okay not much stress actually acting on that okay maybe some part that are, are extra okay so then it's not relevant okay for example you have a, a a structure similar to this okay and you apply a force on these directions and this is our so-called fixed uh, support okay so what happened is that this force or uh, will be trans uh, transfer okay all the energy with so the support will be mainly on this particular part all right so whatever we do on this side okay is less significant okay meaning to say this part even though it has a bad uh aspect ratio is acceptable okay uh those poor element shapes in the model will usually result to a, a poor results okay so then uh, we can see the elements with poor poor shapes okay very large aspect ratio almost like a triangle shapes already a triangle shape even though this is a q4 
and also a very large angle okay and a very small corner angle okay we try to avoid all these things okay but then we cannot control much okay what we can control we do a partitions to minimize the number of this kind of bad elements okay uh you can always use uh symmetric cases okay because we have for example this uh testing a testing bar itself okay we have a uh, fillets and so on okay we can minimize the problem okay by doing a analyze the the where it is symmetry all right and this symmetry itself is uh good somehow to reduce uh the possibility of the meshing algorithm to mesh uh as as uh not as what we want all right so if we you run it okay if a good uh meshing sometimes it give you a good result okay but sometimes it may give you a bad result that's why i told you to do a partitions okay so when we do a a symmetry it's very similar to doing a partitions okay so when you cut it off so you are limit Thing, the the meshing algorithm to a selected uh, area okay so that it it's try to adjust to fit in that particular area itself okay so here uh, again uh, we can see that uh, in this particular transitions of q4 okay and we can see a q4 okay so the algorithm you you start to mesh and then uh, when it approaching to the end okay we try to uh, reduce the number of elements because our stress point is here okay when we want to do a tensile test this is our uh, area that we want to to know right so this part is become less important okay but then when we do a meshing itself uh, we cannot simply connect it directly okay to the to the under q4 okay so what we do we will include a transitions uh, triangle okay so this transitions triangle will helps us to dispute this load okay to the to the other nodes itself right so we can include a transitions uh, triangle okay whenever we we try to match uh from a smaller q4 to a larger q4 and so on right so some software they they may not only focus on the q4 they can do this so-called uh, mixing of triangular elements as well as the quadrilaterals uh, elements itself okay but on their own okay but this is how if we want to really control it okay then this is a better way so you can see that all the elements are actually uh, arranged or meshed in a very uniform way okay so that the behavior become uh, more uniform right so again very uh, cautious to be applied okay whenever we apply a symmetry make sure it's not a Applied to uh, maybe a, a vibration cases or buckling modes or so on because when it buckle we cannot uh, simulate that particular uh, buckling in a symmetry way okay it may buckle in, in non-symmetry way okay so in that case you cannot use symmetry okay so be careful with all, all these things all right how the results the estimated result of your displacement will actually change it is the result of the displacement symmetry if it is then you can uh, use the symmetry if not then you cannot right part of this assignment so you have to uh model this problem okay this typical uh typical test specimen problem right mesh them by applying a symmetry conditions okay not necessary you follow this method okay this is just a guide for you okay you can uh, use whatever methods you would like to match them all right then uh, do the analysis and finally obtain what is the highest stress okay and where is the highest stress occurs okay whether it occurs over here over here over here or anywhere okay so get that value okay using the finite element software right so this would be the second part of your of your assignment too right same thing do it in the powerpoint presentation files okay and do the video recordings 
Then we have these natural deviations and the discontinuity. Con discontinuity can be uh, any kind from a load. Okay, when you suddenly in add a load, a load at this, then uh, there is a discontinuity. Then you may want to subdivide them, right, to increase the number of elements over here, right. Then also there is a abrupt changes in the distributions. Okay, then you may want to partition this and then add this as one element, right. Uh, other cases will include uh, changes in the plate thickness. Okay, suddenly this plate thickness change. Okay, then we need to include an additional point. Okay, to represent that particular changes. Okay, so we have to do a subdivisions or partitions in between that. Okay, particular point. Uh, also, whenever there is a changes in the material property, yes, we have to cut it clear to represent two different materials. Okay, and in some cases there is a uh, uh, some support okay embedded or implant okay inside. So this may be an implant of a of a bones okay surface. Okay, so we can see that we will mesh differently for different uh, material itself. All right, and we also notice that we will always ensure that. Even though they are mesh, okay, we have to make sure the nodes are continuous, okay. They are they are actually a uh, match, right? Unless you apply different kind of uh, uh conditions, okay, it's just like a, a contact type of uh conditions, then the FEA software will treat them differently, okay. Other than that, if we intend just to do a static, or maybe not not really dynamics, okay then this node must be matched together, right? Other natural divisions will be at the re-entrance of corner, our stress concentration, concentration part, or maybe at the, at the whole area, right? So you can cut them into a, a quarter of the plate and simulate them, right? Then also uh, the structure of a disputed load, okay? You may want to naturally uh, add all this meshing, okay, so that we have a proper distribution load actually being represented properly, right? Uh, in the refinement methods, okay, in general, we can classify them into three refinement methods, okay, the H, the P, and the R, okay, so. This refinement methods, uh, you can apply it by doing your own so-called divisions or partitions, okay? Or in the software itself, they have their own so-called refinements, all right? And the software will use the same terminology, H, P, and R, right? So for the H methods, it's actually uh, to approximate the solution with a larger number of uh, lower uh, lower order elements means this is a single single order okay this is a linear linear uh, elements itself okay so what we can do is we increase the number of mesh okay using a larger number okay we can subdivide them into this form or we can subdivide them into a uniform uh, mesh. Okay, we call this as a H mesh. Okay, refine from the original mesh, right? Then for the P methods, it's very straightforward. Okay, we know that by increasing the the linear functions of the displacement itself, the accuracy will increase. Okay, but then you may have the problem with the memories and other things. Okay. So you, we can always increase this type, okay, by increasing the the polynomial shape functions of the of the element itself, right? That is P, the polynomial, right? And the R methods of refinements uh, is when you try to relocate, okay? We try to relocate, okay? Based on our knowledge, we know that the force is acting towards the end, okay? So what we do, we try to shift this. Uh, elements nearer to the load. Okay, this is another way of relocate. Okay, so that this part 
become less significant maybe okay we know that maybe this is not significant then we shift that towards the load right this is the r refinement methods and then this transition triangles, as I've mentioned previously, we can include a transition triangle in between uh, two uh, different size of elements. Okay, so this is necessary. Okay, because the intermediate uh, node, okay, for the Q itself along the edge are inconsistent and the form with the energy formulations of the CST, okay? So it's not recommended that uh, we match them to the intermediate nodes, all right? So this way is okay, all right? Then for the concentrated load point, yes, we can have a load acting on the one point. What we do, we remesh it, okay? Near to the point, we mesh it uh, with a final mesh, all right? And what happened is that in actual cases, okay, theoretically, if we have one single point load, okay, and this point itself actually acting in the infinitesimal uh, area, this point can penetrate through any kind of uh, object, just like a needle, right? Okay, so what happened is that uh, in the finite element analysis, the infinite uh, displacement and the stress are, are never compute. Okay, so what we do is that the infinite displacement and the stress can approach only as the mesh uh, around the load is highly refined. Okay, so if we really want to see how the force actually penetrate through an object, what we can do is we refine more meshes, okay, and see how the, the, the stress actually change at this particular point and whether it will penetrate through or not, okay penetrate through it or not okay so in some case these stresses near the concentrated force are not the object of the study uh, of the study right uh, we can have other ways to model the concentrated load by adding the additional elements okay you can do that but i would not recommend that okay to add additional load okay because that we that may increase uh, especially when you define the material property of your elements okay this material property may may behave differently okay when the fault the load itself is transmitted okay then also uh the stress is predicted at the infinite uh infinite at the re-entrance of a uh, point b okay this is a point right or uh, not b okay what happens is that in the final elements if we are using a linear elastic material model uh, we will never get a uh, convergence, okay, at this particular point, okay, because uh, of these sharp edges, okay. So what we can do is that uh, you can change, okay, by putting a fillet or, uh, yeah, a fillet, okay, to mitigate this so that there is a transition, okay, or else it will... Uh, theoretically calculate as an infinite uh, point itself, okay, or infinite stress acting on that particular point, okay. If we want to simulate an infinite medium, meaning to say, let's say uh, this is a foundation problem, okay, in the civil engineering. So assuming this is a, a ground, okay, a ground, our ground is infinite, right? So you're stepping on ground. So in order to model this, we what we need, we have to decide where to cut, okay? So this uh, idea is that we will do it using a try and error procedure, okay? So this procedure itself, we will try to see how far it is, okay? If we have a lot acting on this particular point, okay? So how far it is, it will affect, okay? and when the the effect is uh insignificant then meaning to say we know this length itself is sufficient okay then we can model it to cut it off right so in these cases we will have to run a pre uh preliminary test of fea okay no fea uh cases we run it directly okay most of the case we will uh, model it okay describe what is the parameters acting on it and then uh 
from there, we will try to uh, put in our load and see what is the result and how it's, it's can be improved, okay? And we will see what happens on this uh, end, okay? Whether it's sufficient or not to, to actually uh, model the whole uh, conditions, okay? Then also when we try to mix different kind of elements, then we have to know the characteristics uh, behind each of these elements, okay? Because they have a different degree of freedom at each node, all right? For the beam, the node itself can rotate, right? But then for this uh, Q4 itself, they cannot rotate. They can only translate, okay? They have different behavior. So when we, we uh, mix them in this particular form, okay? Meaning to say this point A is, uh, is allowed to rotate. So once we put a force, this beam will just go down, okay? We create a mechanisms, okay? So that's why mixing them is, uh, we have to know why, all right? Uh, have to be careful, okay, when we, we try to mix them. So to, to solve this problem, what we can do is we extend it into the, the plane, okay? So that the rotation is here, okay? But then this rotations now is, being uh, constrained, okay, since this point is only allowed to move in the displacement form, okay. So in this way, then yes, the moment due to this P is now transferred to our uh, plane elements, right. Uh, in the interpretations of the stress, uh, in general, uh, or the common practice, the those stress are evaluated at the centroid of the elements, okay? But alternatively, in most of the, the software itself, we can use an average, and this average is actually the values of the stress evaluated at each node of the elements, all right? So how we evaluate, we can sometimes evaluate it at the Gauss point, okay? We have four Gauss point for each of this uh, Q4, all right? So we have, let's say we have a four, four Q4 elements, okay, as shown here, okay. So this uh, Gauss point may transfer or this value, once we compute it, we can transfer or extrapolate it, okay, to the node itself, okay. So we call this uh, averaging methods, okay. Or we can also when we, C2 elements are actually combining. So this stress value also being put to the same node, right? Remember this node are a single node itself, okay? So what happened is that this node will do an averaging of the node, okay? We will call it as smooth thing, okay? So this is how the software can actually uh, shows you a, a nice colorful gradients of a stress, okay? because they are doing a smooth thing between them, okay? But then we have to take into considerations, okay? This kind of smooth thing may lead to uh, some kind of error, okay? When we interpret it, okay? This happens when we use, there is a changes in the thickness, okay? Or the material stiffness, okay? Meaning to say, if let's say this is a very large element, okay? And this is a very small element, okay? Then this point itself, when we average them together, may not uh, represent the real uh, conditions, okay? Because this part the is larger than the stress occurs may be lower, okay? And this part is smaller, the stress uh, acting may be larger, but then when we average them, they cancel out each other, okay? That leads to the so-called, uh, some kind of error in the result itself. Okay, same thing for the string fit uh, problem. Okay, the circumference stress between the matting uh, cylinders are normally, uh, are usually quite different. Okay, so you have to take care into this, uh, this connections in between different materials and so on. Okay, even though it shows you a very nice uh, results. Okay. Uh, in general, uh, we would, always check the results for consistency, okay? As I've mentioned, first thing, first check the displacement uh, characteristics, 
or the displacement result and see whether it's behave as what we intend or not okay then only we will try to check for others uh, consistency for example we will check whether the support node really give us a zero displacement or not okay a symmetry exists okay then it should behave like a symmetry okay then uh the last part will be uh when we come we try to validate our results okay then what we need to do we have to compare our result with any kind of technique okay it can be anything from theoretical part okay we can do it from formulas okay we can get it from experiments or we can also do fea okay as i say we can do a preliminary uh, fea get a idea of how it behaves and we try to remesh it and see whether this behavior change okay and if it change why we have to understand okay we have we have to to compare okay so that uh, we can justify okay what we present okay so here is a tutorial for you okay you can try this tutorial in the lisa fa as well if you don't have then maybe uh, you can try other software if can't uh, you can skip this right this one for those who really don't have a computer right so i recommend you to try this okay so that's all for this lecture for those who are celebrating selamat hari raya and travel safely right see you again bye bye